Shalom, Israel. This is going to be a quick history lesson. Um, it will also deal with some um, some precepts from the Bible. So it's a it's a history Bible lesson, um, both in one, but mainly a history lesson. Um, before we jump into this lesson, and the reason I'm doing this lesson is because I've had a couple people actually ask me to do a lesson on this, um, and, and I've had people who have asked me questions about this subject. So that's how this lesson came about. Um, before we jump into this lesson, I just want to address something. I had someone comment on, I did a video about pagan holidays on a lunch break. It was just a quick little seven minute video. And um, I had somebody commenting, I guess, from like one of the Foot Clan camps talking about, oh man, well, first they commented on spiritual Israel and was like, oh, you done done it now. You done done it now. You done, you done tripped yourself up. But that's all they said, so I just deleted it. Uh, <clears throat> but the other comment was about what I said about the Galatians and um, the Galatians being a Celtic people. And they were like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, where's the evidence the Galatians were Northern Kingdom Israelites? Blah, 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 blah. All right. Two, two things really quickly. One, I don't deal with... Um, pseudo history or whatever like i deal with academic history like what can be we're living in the time of the gentiles people and they're the ones who are in control and they're the ones who are keeping the records and stuff now so you, you know that's where you got to go to study and learn and learn some stuff this stuff that y'all come up with from your you know someone in your camp got a revelation like 50 years ago about something that doesn't make it factual okay um now, that being said, there's a couple things with that since the person and, and I should have left their comment up and just responded online like but um, I did not So but I should have. But the point is this: number one, with the Foot Clan camps, you teach that the northern kingdom came over here to the Americas, which is the same thing the Mormons teach. It's also in that same doctrine is also used by people who teach uh British Israelism and Christian identity, except for with them, they say instead of them coming to the Americas that they went into Europe as the Scythians, which is false. Anyways, uh, and just one thing off top to prove that's false. Paul talks about the Scythians, and I believe it's Colossians he mentions the Scythians. You can look it up, though. In one of his epistles, he mentions the Scythians, and it differentiates the Scythians from the Israelites. He doesn't talk about them like they're... Um, you know, Israelites, they're a separate, different group of people. Anyways, just learning something on your way to learning something. Going forward, though, so the Foot Clan camps of the Hebrew Israelite groups, you teach that they came over here to the Americas, right? Never, and then so you have this chart, and you say that the people in Latin America, all of them, according to this chart, are Israelites, depending on where they live. Even though Latin America is made up primarily of Europeans, um, Mizitsos, which are mixed Europeans and Native Americans, mulattoes, mixture of European and African slaves, and Afro Latinos, descendants of the slaves that were brought there, and indigenous people. Those are all different groups of people, but somehow you've lumped them all together and say that they're all Israelites, right? Which even that gets confusing to me because you say Puerto Rico is Ephraim, but then you say Negroes are Judah and Benjamin and Levi, but so is the Afro Latino, is he Ephraim or is he Judah, Benjamin, Levi? These are all things, like I said, that don't make any sense. Then you call the white man the Edomites, which is a whole nother lesson for another day on top of that, which because you're misinterpreting things when it comes to that. But what about so what about the white people who live in Latin America, which some countries in Latin America are overwhelmingly European? Um, for example, Costa Rica, Argentina, Chile, these are all countries that are majority European. Um, Uruguay as well. How do you explain these things? But anyway, so let's get back to this, your, this original premise. So if they're the Northern Kingdom Israelites, how come then there's two occasions where a Passover is being held in Judah in the 600s uh, BC? This is like 100 years after the Assyrian captivity. And it says that, and you can find this in Chronicles, and it says that people from the northern kingdom came, lots of them came, that they hop on ships and sail over here and sail from the Americas to Jerusalem to keep this Passover, or were they already still in that area, okay? That's number one, that refutes this, that refutes this nonsense. 
Number two, and I believe if y'all say that Asher is like Brazil, then explain to me why in the time in Jesus' day, you can find this in the Gospels, it's in Luke, it mentions that there was a prophetess of the tribe of Asher. And this is in Jesus' day. So how did she get to how did she get to Israel? She hopped on a boat and sold from and sailed from Brazil. The scripture doesn't tell us that. Scripture tells us that she was already there in the area. So where do you, the, the Bible doesn't line up with what you teach. Another thing, if Cornelius was a Gentile based off of that rationale, then how come the people were dealing with this woman from the tribe of Asher? Wouldn't they have been like, oh, you're a Gentile. You know, I can't sit and eat with you. All right. Your doctrine is bogus. It makes no sense. And now back to the original thing with the Galatians, the the city of Galatia was founded by Gaelic people or Galatians who came from thrice. You had Celtic people, also known as Gauls, living in France also as well. Uh, over time, they got pushed out by Germanic groups. You also had a particular branch of Celtic people living on the Iberian Peninsula. Once again, same thing. Germanic groups pushed a lot of them out. You still have a little bit of these Celtic people living in Spain today. Um, but for the most part, the majority of Celtic people now live on the British Isles. But the point is, is go look this up about Galatia. This is common knowledge. If you just Google the city of Galatia and study its origins and how it was founded, it will tell you that it was founded by Galatians and that the Galatians were a Celtic people. OK, um, yeah, all the history that I give on here, I do thorough research and I present facts. My background is in history. I'm not on here to mislead anybody. We just present information as it is. OK, sorry for the detour. But the purpose of this lesson is um, to explain the Hyksos time of rulership in Egypt and how that relates to the Bible and just to clear up some confusion. So. The objective of this lesson is using historical research and the Bible, we will demonstrate the following. Hyksos were migrants from Mesopotamia or Assyria, and I have in there Padan Aram because a lot of them came from the northern portion of Mesopotamia, were um, in parts of modern day Syria. Um, also, I would strongly recommend that you get pen and paper or open up something, a document on your computer so that you can take notes because there's going to be concepts that we're going over in this lesson that I'm not going to be able to give you background on because we want to move through this lesson pretty quickly. And it's not going to be long at all, but it's like some of the information I've gone over so many times and lessons and people who follow me and have seen those lessons are, are already up to speed on these subjects. So I don't feel the need to go over them again. But if you're not up to speed on these subjects, then you need to take notes. And so you can go and look these up on your own time. OK, anyways, and um, the Hiscokes, the Hyksos were migrants from Mesopotamia or Assyria and Palestine who migrated into Kemet over the course of a few hundred years. OK. Um, also, they were made up primarily of Canaanites, more specifically the Amorites. And the reason why I say more specifically the Amorites, it was predominantly the Amorites. And on your own time, you can go look up the table of nations in Genesis 10. And it'll let you know that the Amorites came from Canaan. So they are also technically Canaanites. OK, they're just a branch of Canaanites. Next, they took over rulership in Kemet circa 1650 B.C. to 1570 B.C. And I have circa there because that just means around about that time when it comes to these like labeling stuff precisely in ancient times. Um, you know, oftentimes we can't be exactly precise. We And I don't like to be I don't like to use exact price. I don't like to use uh, exactly precise dates. If there is multiple theories on what the precise date is, what I do is I will take those what the theories are and um, average them out, and I'm going to give you a circa or a roundabout date. Okay, so they took over rulership in Kemet circa 1650 BC to 1570 BC. This is when the Pharaoh who and it's supposed to say who knew not Joseph arose. Sorry, but I left that part out. But this is when the Pharaoh or the king. And it actually says king. It doesn't say Pharaoh, but the king who arose, who did not know Joseph in Egypt, arose during that time period, during the Hyksos rulership. And we're going to get the scripture precepts for this, too. Um, part two, there were three causes for their migration into Egypt. Um, one was the end of their hegemony in Assyria and Mesopotamia. 
That's something else you'll have to look up on your own time, but we'll discuss it a little bit later. Later, Assyria and Mesopotamia are synonymous, one and the same. Um, but like I said, we'll discuss that a little bit later in the lesson. Um, and the Amorites actually ruled in Babylon for a, a brief period of time and were the dominant group there. But we're going to read about that as well with sources. Uh, when their hegemony in that area ended, that was one of the causes for their migration as well. Another cause for their migration was displacement by Hebrews. And we're going to discuss that as well, because you had a large scale Hebrew migration into this area, uh, which at that time we call it the Middle East now or West Asia. But in reality, it's really just Northeast Africa. And it was all originally a part of the land of Ham. But you had Hebrews who came in and started settling in the areas um, of Palestine and the Arabian Peninsula and Jordan and stuff, where all these areas were originally inhabited by Hamitic peoples, Canaanites, you know, Phoenicians, uh, also Cushites, because you had Nimrod is the one who founded Assyria. But we're going to discuss that a little bit later. Um, and the Bible tells you that. And he was an Ethiopian or a Cushite. And then you also had um, descendants of Cush who also founded areas in the Arabian Peninsula. And then they would later be supplanted. They would be also supplanted by Hebrew groups, um, which we're going to discuss later on in this in this lesson. So as a part of that displacement, that's another reason why you had a lot of Amorites and other groups in that area um, of uh, Palestine and uh, Mesopotamia or Syria migrating into Egypt. Lastly, famines. There was um, a specifically two major famines that took place that the Bible mentions and gives, it, and gives examples of that people went into Egypt because of the famine. OK, so I hope you enjoy the rest of this lesson. We're just going to read some history and hopefully provide clarification on this subject. OK. OK, so first, let's learn who the Hyksos were. The Hyksos, the founders of the Egyptian 15th dynasty, Asiatics who exercised political, political control over Egypt between approximately 1655 and 1570 BCE. And the reason when they're saying Asiatics, they don't mean like Chinese. They mean it just means Eastern. And that was the term that the Egyptians are the ancient Kemetic people used. To describe anybody along the eastern Mediterranean are essentially any people that were east of Egypt. They described them as Asiatics. OK, um, the Hyksos established their capital at Avaris in east in the eastern Delta. Controlled the Nile Valley as far south as Her Hermopolis and claimed overlordship over the rest of upper Egypt. Avaris has been identified as Tel Adab in the Northeast Delta. Most of the Hyksos personal names are West Semitic in the same language group as Amorite and the Canaanite and Aramaic dialect. So it's letting you know that the Hyksos language was the same as the Amorites, the Canaanites, which are the Phoenicians. And the Amorites are just a branch of Canaanites. Remember, the, I told you, you can go look that up on your own, that Amorites descended from Canaan. So they're just a branch of Canaanites. And Aramaic, which Aramaic is the language that was spoken in Syria, um, not Assyria, but Syria or what was known as Damascus or Aram Damascus or, you know, the Aramean civilization. Later on, um, Aramaic becomes the dominant language in Assyria, which is Mesopotamia. That happens uh, later on. That will happen. So this is letting you know where these migrants came from. You can determine this based off of language. And um, so they came from the Amorites and people in Syria. And so we know that the people, um, the Amorites at this time were living in Mesopotamia, what is modern day Jordan, parts of uh, Palestine and parts of Syria. OK. All right. There seemed to be no Hurarian names, as was once thought. Hyksos reflects Heku Kaus, the rulers of foreign lands the name given them by their Egyptian contemporaries. They were also referred to as Asiatics, the standard name for the inhabitants of the Eastern Mediterranean littoral, Canaan and Syria. After having, and that's basically just what we just covered. 
Um, after having infiltrated into the Nile Valley over a period of several centuries, so you see that this migration of them coming into Egypt took place over a couple hundred years. It wasn't just massive all at one time, all at one time. And we covered in the objective the reasons why this migration happened. And um, we're going to go we'll go into details as we progress in this lesson um, over those issues that caused them to have to migrate. Uh, they managed to seize the kingship during the chaotic period, which ended the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. At the beginning of the 18th dynasty, circa 1580 BC, Pharaoh Amas expelled the Hyksos from Egypt and pursued them to southern Palestine. After besieging Sharuhin in the south for three years, he defeated them. His successors, Amen Ophis, the I, and the III, completed their expulsion from Egypt. Most of the archaeological data on the Hyksos comes from sites in the eastern delta. Among these are Tel Adaba, the largest, Tel El Mashkuda, and Tel El Yahudeya. Other information comes from scarabs and monuments from various sites in Nubia and Palestine, as well as Egypt. And Nubia, that's just Moreau, that's Kush, okay? The ancient empire of Kush. The material available at present shows Hyksos culture to be that of Middle Bronze Age Palestine and Phoenicia. In the course of time, Hyksos material culture shows increasing Egyptianizing features. Okay, and then some scholars debate the existence of, of evidence of Hyksos fortifications. And for the purposes of uh, this lesson, that's where we're gonna stop with that. And now I'm gonna give you the source for this information. Okay, and here's the source for that information. It's from the Hyksos entry in uh, Encyclopedia Judaica. Um, and as you, I'm not going to read all the details. You can see the reference information there if you want to pull it up. It's from um, pages 648 through 649. Okay, next we're going to read about the Amorites because as we've um, established, the bulk of the Hyksos um, migrants into Egypt would have been Amorites based off of uh, where it said that they came from because that's where the Amorites were. And um, also you're going to get some historical background um, on the subject as well. Here showing that that's where primarily they would have came from. Uh, and like I always do their sources for these at the bottom, but Amorites, nomadic people of Western Mesopotamia, instrumental in the collapse of the Ur Third Kingdom around 2000 BC, who then settled amongst the Babylonians and integrated with them. Now, mind you, when it says here, this is why I said you're going to have to take notes. I have the scripture at the end of this lesson that lets you know that the Chaldeans were founded by the Assyrians. Like they were, they're Gentiles. The original founders of Mesopotamia were not the Chaldeans. The Bible tells you that. So when I hear these people from camp saying, oh, the Chaldeans were Ethiopians, they were Cushites. No, the Assyrians were Cushites. Okay, those were the people. And we're going to discuss that coming up. But they were the original people who founded that, uh, founded the empire. It's all in the Bible with Nimrod. Just go read Genesis chapter 10 and it lets you know. He founded Mesopotamia and all of those cities. OK, anyways, so but for a brief period of time um, around 2000 B.C., the Amorites had taken over essentially Mesopotamia and they had began ruling in Mesopotamia and assimilating amongst the Assyrians and the ancient Babylonians. OK, let's keep reading. Uh, who then settled amongst the Babylonians and integrated with them. The first eminent Amorite king was Gungunum, part of the Larsa dynasty. In the early 2nd millennium BC, an Amorite dynasty emerged at Babylon under Summa Abum, initiating the old Babylonian period from soon after 2000 BC down to 1600 BC. The later Amorite capital was Mari on the middle Euphrates. The Amorites eventually amalgamated with the Canaanites and in later times can be identified with the small kingdom 
an associated language group in northern Syria. Okay. All right. So this is revealing to you where these Hyksos came from. But just to go deeper into some stuff for the I'll get into some Moorish stuff. The reason we, it said their capital was Mari and the term that the Assyrians or the Mesopotamians use, uh, reason why they were called like Amaru meaning West or Western on the other side for them, meaning on the other side of the Euphrates River. And later on, this same term can said to be some people believe this same term was used um, for the Moors or Mauritania or the Mori people living in northwest Africa by like the Egyptians and stuff. Uh, going forward and that might be where we get the term more from just learning something on your way to learning something just throwing that out there all right next here's another entry because i have two sources here for the amorites inhabitants of trans jordan before the entry of the israelites perhaps settled by 1900 bc they resisted the newcomers but were expelled compiling the story in the 7th century bc the Deuteronomist editor regards their expulsion as as the proper reward for their for their idolatry. Joshua 24 and 18. All right. So my two sources here for the Amorites come from um, the concise Oxford Dictionary of Archaeology. Excuse me. And a dictionary of the Bible. And you have the sources there and, you know, the additions and where they came from. Um in the last lesson that I did about Israelites in the American South, I, I gave you a source. I didn't put it up on the screen, but I talked about it. So you can go back there and check that source. But uh, that source that I used, it lets you know that the Punic people, which remember all the Punic people were, were Phoenicians or Canaanites and Israelites that were living in North and Northwest Africa in Old Testament times and in Roman times. And it lets you know that that word Punic means dark skin. And you're going to notice a common trait is that. So they're calling the Phoenicians dark skin. Um, the word for Egypt also comes from meaning dark skin. The word for Ham, which is where you get Kemet from, also means dark skin. Same thing with Ethiopia. It means dark. Like the terms that they use usually always just mean black. OK. And even today with the names of countries that the colonizers gave, uh, like Sudan back in the day, that just means land of blacks. Guinea means land of blacks. I've covered that as well, too, because it goes back to a, um, a Berber word that it can be traced back to that essentially just means the same thing, land of blacks. Nigeria means land of blacks. OK, just learning something on your way to learning something. OK, so we're just going to uh, talk with some few talking points. And then after this, we have the last slide with some precepts that will um, pretty much uh, sum up what we've been talking about. But anyway, some key things to remember is that um, around circa 2080 B.C., that's when you have Abraham living in the plain of Mamre amongst the Amorites. So Abraham, remember how I was telling you the Hebrews caused displacement, which we're going to talk about coming up with point uh, four. That's an example of letting you know that Abraham was living amongst the Amorites. And you can find that in Genesis 14. And you can read that on your own time. And you have a major battle that happens uh, between the dominant world powers at that time, the different Mesopotamian kings. You even got a Gentile king. You got, you know, Canaanites with the Sodom and Gomorrah and all of that battling it out. And Abraham had to go and rescue Lot. You can go read about that. Um, but the Amorites were also involved in that battle. And you can read about that in Genesis 14. But just to give you some time period of when these things were happening. OK. And remember, around this same time, circa 2000 B.C. is when the Amorites begin to um, establish themselves as the dominant group in Babylon or Assyria or Mesopotamia. OK. Point two, um, circa 1800 B.C., Joseph passes away. And like I said, I do um, taking from a lot of different sources and averaging out the time. And from the best that we can figure, it would be around that time. Circa 1800 B.C., Joseph passes away. OK, next. Another thing we wanted to bring up were famines, because I, I talked about how there were famines that were going on in the world at that time that caused people to have to migrate into Egypt. So one that you can read about on your own time 
is Genesis chapter 12, where there was a famine and Abraham went into Egypt. So this is just establishing that it was kind of common practice for people in the Middle Eastern areas that when a famine came into place, they went down into Egypt uh, for, you know, for food and to continue living during the famine. OK, and some of this is because Egypt had, you know, uh, saved up sources of food, but also Egypt was kind of a breadbasket because the Nile being so fertile and them able to grow crops alongside the Nile. Also, they had access to the Nile going deeper into Africa, just like the Kushites did, going deeper into Eastern and Central Africa, and where you even have more fertile and it starts turning into a more tropical environment. And they were able to get goods from there as well and, you know, ship that up to Egypt. So Egypt was a place that a lot of people went to uh, <clears throat> in uh, ancient times when famines came about. And that was one of the reasons why the, some of the Hyksos, our Amorite groups, went into Egypt. OK, next. Um, oh, and you can also read about Joseph. That was another time, you know, that was another time where there was a famine and people started going into Egypt because of the famine. And the Bible confirms that. Um, history confirms that as well. Excuse me. Point four, displacement by Hebrews. And I have Arabs, Israelites, Midianites, Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, etc. Because I've covered this so many times that a Hebrew is a descendant of Eber. OK. And these descendants of Eber, as I discussed earlier, came in and displaced a lot of Hamitic groups that were originally living in um, the Levant and the Arabian Peninsula. OK. And these groups. So you had like Jokatan, which was. Um, who settled in the southern Arabian Peninsula and founded a branch of Arabs. You have the Ishmaelites who later came from Abraham and they also um, established the nation in the Arabian Peninsula. And these are where you get your two main branches of Arabs. And you have to keep in mind, remember, all of these people, by the time the Israelites come out of Egypt for the exodus, all of these people have already established themselves in the region as nations. And the Bible even lets you know, like, oh, like, for example, where the Edomites settled, that originally you have the Horites living there and the Edomites replaced them. I could go on and you got the, Ken the Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, and they get replaced. Like, so... The Bible clearly gives you the history on this and history also backs these things up. But uh, and all of those groups were Hamitic groups are descendants of Ham that eventually got um, supplanted by Hebrews. Just to take this a little step further. That's why I'm always saying a lot of the stuff that goes on in Africa is thousands and thousands of years old. And it goes back to Bible times, because even today you have countries in sub-Saharan Africa where you have the descendants of Hamites, these different groups, whether they be Canaanites, whether they be descendants from the ancient Egyptians, or whether they be descendants from Cushites. And then you have Bantus, who are essentially are people from the Niger-Congo group, who a lot of them are Hebrews. You have some mixtures of Canaanites in there. I've discussed that before with lessons. And there's ways to the, you, and if you wanted to determine who the Israelites are, you, you use the Bible. And it tells you, it's simple, like those who were dispersed via slavery on slave ships throughout the entire world okay if you didn't if that didn't happen to your people then you don't fit the bill uh but anyways the point is is so later on you have these bantu groups now like a thousand years ago 1500 years ago 500 years ago migrating into areas where you have the descendants of these hamitic people living today and they and so that beef ends up happening again where it's like oh man here come these Hebrews again, essentially following us wherever we go. Um, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to put that, you know, put that out there. But because of that displacement in the area with all these different Hebrew groups, the Ammonites and the Moabites. Remember, um, the Amorites were also living in Jordan. But the Ammonites and the Moabites who come from Lot, Abraham's nephew, they ended up supplanting them there. You also have the Midianites who were also descendants of Abraham who settled in different areas over there that ended up supplanting them. And then ultimately you have the Israelites coming out of Egypt who, uh, you know, end up doing the same thing. Okay. So that's part, that's another part of the reason why 
they ended up, um, the Amorites ended up having to migrate and a lot of them started migrating into Egypt. Lastly, I just wanted to deal with Assyria. And that also goes along with the fifth, with the third reason they ended up migrating. When the Assyrians reestablished control over Mesopotamia, uh, and removed the Amorites, that's another reason why a lot of them started migrating in mass into Egypt. Uh, also because a lot of their areas that were a part of their traditional homeland in the 1600s were now being occupied by Hebrews. So they couldn't even go back to original lands. So they ended up going into Assyria. Uh, I just want to point out something with Assyria. Remember, you can find in the book of Judges, um, it lets you know that the king of, at the time, there was a king of Mesopotamia named Chushan Rithium. And the reason, and his name means the twice evil Cushite. So why was his name the twice evil Cushite? Because the original founder of the Assyrian Empire was Nimrod, a Cushite. And so later on, now you have Chushan, also a descendant of Nimrod, ruling over Mesopotamia. That's just learning something on your way to learning something. The other thing you have to remember with Assyria is there's different periods. There's the Akkadian, Neo-Sumerian period, Old, Middle, and Neo. And you have to know which period you're talking about when dealing with Assyria's history. All right. Told you this lesson wasn't going to be that long. Um, let's close out with a couple precepts. Um, Genesis 48, 21 through 22. And Israel, that's Jacob, and Israel said unto Joseph, Excuse me. Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again onto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So it's letting you know here that at some point Jacob had just like we read about Abraham having to go to war with against like the dominant world powers at the time and Abraham being successful. Obviously, Jacob had to go up against the Amorites at a, at a time and was successful. This is just a one precept just to show you that um, the Hebrews coming into the area caused massive displacement for Hamitic groups. And in this lesson, we're specifically dealing with the Amorites. But just to show you, even with Jacob coming into the area, there was disruption amongst the Amorites, which would have caused them to end up migrating into um, Egypt, forming this group of people called the Hyksos. And I want to be clear that we're just identifying that a large component of the Hyksos would have been Amorites. There, were, there would have also been other groups who migrated in amongst the Hyksos who also came, uh, who came from that area because the areas where the Amorites were living, um, you have to also remember that the Amorites had started ruling over Babylon for a little while. So you had other groups of people coming up under them and under, and under their leadership and allying themselves with them. So when you have the collapse of the Amorite hegemony in the area, there those groups who had allied themselves with the Amorites and attached themselves, more than likely they would have migrated with them into um, Egypt. Okay. Next, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8. Just one quick verse. Now there arose up a new king in, over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So you have to ask yourself, who is this new king that would have rose up who wouldn't remember Joseph when Joseph literally, according to the Bible, Joseph saved Egypt from starving to death. And Joseph was made second in command under Pharaoh. Um, it tells us that in the Bible. Well, the reason a new king arose up that knew not Pharaoh was because this happened between the middle and new kingdom when the in Egypt, when the Hyksos were ruling. And remember, on the previous slide, we had the timeline. Um, Joseph probably died somewhere around 1800 B.C. Remember, the Hyksos don't start ruling to around 1650 B.C., circa, around that time. So somewhere around like 125 years, 100 years, 150 years after Joseph's um, time or death, that's when you would have the Hyksos coming to power, okay? And the Bible actually gives us a precept on this to clear things up. That's why you have to do here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept. That's the same thing you have to do with history. That's why a lot of people who are into history tend to be good at, you know, when it comes to studying the Bible, because that's the same thing we have to do. Like someone asked me a question about the, the Hyksos. So now I'm putting it together for you doing, you know, precept upon precept. Like I have to break down to you. Well, let's find out who the Hyksos were. Now let's find out where could these people come from based off of, you know, what where they say the Hyksos come from. 
oh, that we look at that time where they're saying the Hyksos came from, that's where the Amorites were. And the Amorite, you see what I'm saying? So we built upon um, things, you know, brick by brick by brick. And you have to do the same thing with the Bible. And it lets you know here in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse four, it says, for thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. So it's letting you know that the when the Israelites went into Egypt to sojourn, sojourn there, when was that? That's when Jacob and all the 12 tribes went into Israel, right? And then we know, according to the Exodus story, that eventually hard bondage and chattel slavery was put upon the Israelites. Well, the scripture, the prophet Isaiah is letting you know here in Isaiah 52 and verse 4 that it was an Assyrian who oppressed them, okay? And that's where the Hyksos come into play, all right? Because remember, as we discussed, a lot of the Amorites were a lot of the Hyksos would have been Amorites and their allies from a, from out of Assyria. And remember, the Amorites were ruling over Babylon and ruling over Assyria for a brief period of time. OK, up until them migrating into Egypt, you have the end of Amorite uh, hegemony in the area in the Middle East it happens right at the same time that you um, have the Hyksos coming to power in Egypt. These are all things just to keep in mind. So the scriptures lets you know that it was an Assyrian who oppressed them, who was the leader over Egypt at the time when the Israelites were put into hard bondage. So hopefully this clears that up and give some explanation on who the Hyksos were according to history and according to the Bible. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. The last point on here is just to bring up the fact that the Chaldeans are not descendants from the Ethiopians. The Chaldeans came later and the original inhabitants of Mesopotamia are Assyria, was founded by Nimrod, a Cushite. That's who the, the descendants of the Cushites were. Um, Isaiah 23 and 13. Behold, the land of the Chaldeans, this people was not till the Assyrian founded it for them that dwell in the wilderness. They set up the towers thereof, they raised up the places thereof, and he brought it to ruin. So it's letting you know that the Assyrians put, the Chaldeans were living in the wilderness. And this all goes back to like, even with ancient history, I always like to bring up this point. The Gentiles, we're living in a time of the Gentiles right now. So they're the ones who are most civilized and they're the ones running the world. That's what that's just the way that it is. But in ancient times, it was the reverse. OK, uh, and, th and life just goes through cycles because in ancient times, up until you get to the Greco-Roman period, um, a lot of what we call now the Indo-European groups weren't living um, in the best conditions. And by definition, would not be their societies would not have been considered highly civilized. OK, uh, that's just learning something on your way to learning something. All right. Like I said, I hope you all were blessed by the lesson. Shalom.